All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, tonight's lecture discussion is going to be um, in regards to scientific or expert opinion evidence. Um, we're going to talk about uh, one case in particular that governs what the standard is for letting scientific evidence in. And this is the current governing case uh, now that applies. Uh, of course, you know, law changes, you know, the Supreme Court makes decisions. And um, the case we're talking about is actually a Supreme Court. We're going to talk about is actually a Supreme Court case uh, that changed a longstanding rule. Um, so it was the mixture of a, a, a change in the rules of evidence and then the uh, Supreme Court. Um, uh, what do I say? Uh, um, actually, um, applying that change in, in the rule of evidence and saying this governs and not the old case that that no longer governs. Uh, so we're going to talk more about that. I know that it is. I'm going to make sure I actually post the case, uh, for you to read as well, uh, with, with the, uh, with the lecture. So you can, uh, read through it before reading the lecture. Um, and that way you'll get a, a better understanding of it. I, I believe I already posted it anyway, but I'll still go ahead and um, post it so you can read it um, after or before the lecture. Um, so this isn't necessarily, uh, th this is probably the most difficult uh, or deep uh, <laughs> um, information you'll get from this class, but I wanted to teach it um, because, of course, uh, this is courtroom testimony. So I don't want you to go walk away from this class uh, not, for one, knowing how to testify better if you're going to ever be called, or well, not better, but if you're going to be a, a good witness at trial uh, and know what how to prepare. But I also want you to, want you to know some rules of admissibility. Um, you know, we talked about the hearsay rule. That kind of governs what you can and can't say. And knowing a little bit about what you can and can't say and how you need to phrase what you're saying is very important. Um, if you know that walking in, you especially if you're going to be in law enforcement, um, if you know that walking in, that will make you a more, I don't want to say better witness, because that kind of makes it sound like you're fabricating a story, uh, you know, prefabricating before you come to court. But it'll make you a more efficient witness. Um, that means more of what you say, you can get the truth out uh without being um objected to um so i want to limit that I, then i also just for learning purposes some of you guys are going to actually be um possibly be expert witnesses that means you're going to be asked to come to court and and give an expert opinion based upon some type of either science or knowledge base um some of you're going to be in forensics um some of you're going to be you know some of you're going to be um Coroners, coroners or medical examiners, that means you're going to be asked to come in and testify, you know, as to time of death, stuff like that, uh, time, you know, time of death, um, cause of death, um, and other things, maybe even tissues, fibers, what the murder weapon was and how you determine that was the murder weapon or how you match this murder, we th this weapon that wasn't found at the scene of the crime and how you determine that that was definitively the weapon that was used. So, all that stuff uh, can kind of go into the realm of being uh, scientific or expert-based testimony. I always say scientific, but it's not, it's not necessarily about being scientific, which you'll learn when we talk about this case. Um, sometimes it's just about something, uh, a knowledge base or something specific, uh, a specific knowledge base that, that kind of makes it a, a science of sorts. So we'll talk about that. Uh, then we're also going to talk about the process. Uh, by which uh expert testimony is allowed in court like what what is the process how is it tendered because you don't just walk in and say hey i'm an expert and start testifying so uh we'll talk about that at the end but first let's do the uh, difficult part um and that is talk about the case the case is daubert versus merrill dow pharmaceuticals incorporated now um, it's a 1993 case out of california um started in federal court in california um, it's a United States Supreme Court case that determined the, the standard for admitting expert testimony in federal courts. Now, of course, it talks about federal courts, but of course, it spills down because this is a constitutional ruling. That means it also spills down to state courts. Um, 
the Darbert court held that the enactment of federal rules of evidence, and we're going to go over this one particular rule um, uh, momentarily, um, and this is rule 702 of federal rules of evidence, but um, the Darbert case held that the enactment of rule 702 implicitly overturned a prior standard, which was the Fry standard. So um, we have to talk about the prior ruling standard uh, that was actually in place before this lawsuit. And we're going to also talk about what, what the lawsuit's about. So we're going to go into some facts about this case at hand. Uh, so that means we're also going to talk a little bit about the ruling uh, from the, the older case that was kind of the precedent of uh, and um, that was the precedent that at least one side argued. So facts about the case. Uh, you have two children, uh, one of which being Jason Daubert and the other being Eric Schuler, and they were born with serious birth defects. Um, so, uh, their, their parents, uh, on behalf of them, they sued, uh, Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals, uh, which is a pharmaceutical company that produced, uh, a, um, a, a medicine of sort or a pill, something called, uh, Bendectin. Um, and th they sued because they claim, I mean, the, uh, the Dalberts, uh, and Dalbert and Schuler or the Dalberts sued because they claimed that Bendectin, um, caused the birth defect of those two children. Uh, so essentially they were suing because they said, well, this medicine caused the birth defect and you didn't know it, you didn't let us know, and we want compensation um, because our children um, have birth defects. Um, so had you studied and known that, you would have, you know, we, we could have known and we could have decided whether or not to take this medicine or, you know, this, this new drug, or we, we would have known to take the drug, but not to have tried to get pregnant or taken it while, uh, we were pregnant. So, um, in other words, we didn't, we weren't given all the information and now our, our children, our children have birth defects. So that was the basis of the lawsuit. So the plaintiff in the lawsuit were, were the Dalberts and the defendant was the Merrill Dow pharmaceutical company. So they were suing them because for a defective medication and that that medication was bendectin um so uh what happened procedurally so it, it started off in um the district court in the, in california so they uh filed lawsuit um and it, and uh it was in california district federal court um now this is civil. So what happens in civil cases, uh, you know, in civil cases, it's a whole bunch of paper back and forth. A lawsuit's filed. An answer to the lawsuit is then filed in return. And it has to be done in a certain amount of time. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of paper that goes back and forth in filings. Um, and then motions start getting filed. Once all the paper is filed, and you know, in a certain discovery motions where stuff starts going back and forth, uh, then one side or the other. Uh, can file a motion to have the court just dismiss the case just based on what's in the filings. And in other words, the court can review everything that's been filed, all the motions that have been made, and say just based upon the paper, without going to trial, this you know we're going to render a decision. Um, and that's usually saying you know usually that's based upon a defect of some sort in the case. Uh, that can be found in, in one of the party's uh, motions or, or something they file with the court. So uh, a means of doing that is what we call um, a summary judgment. So what happened is the Dalberts filed the lawsuit. And, you know, of course, uh, Merrill, Merrill Pharmaceuticals, Merrill Dow or Dow Pharmaceuticals filed an answer, went back and forth. And then uh, Dow Pharmaceuticals said we're going to file what, what they call a motion for summary judgment. What that is is they're saying, judge, look at the documents, I mean, just the filings, and make a ruling uh, to, to dismiss the case because the filings aren't enough or there's something in evidence that's not going to be sufficient um, or something in their, in their argument that's not going to be sufficient. So they filed the summary judgment uh, because... Uh, uh, the expert that was used, of course, because this is a pharmaceutical, very scientific case. So uh, there had to be um, a determination. So essentially, this case is about whether or not Bendectin, this drug, actually caused the birth defect. 
Um, so what Dar- what Merrill Dow Pharmaceutical did is they said, well, because there have been no studies and there's no accepted scientific conclu- scientific I'm sorry conclusion or study or something that's generally accepted by the scientific community to determine whether or not this drug is linked to birth defects, um, then we believe that the court should uh, dismiss the case because whatever expert that the Dauberts bring to try to show that it is connected, um, there's no um, science, whatever they use is not generally accepted by the scientific community. So, and I, um, so generally accepted. What it, where's that come from? That come, that came from an older case, um, the and which was the ruling case at the time, and that was the Fry case. So of course, um, uh, that's what happened at at district court. So at district court, um, the court actually ruled in favor of uh Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals. They said, well, you're right. Um, there's not uh the 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 Dalberts actually have a, an, an expert that's going to say that this drug is connected to birth defects, but you're right because you're, you're correct. Dow pharmaceuticals, because there's nothing, there's no scientific, uh, no, the, the scientific community does not generally accept. Um, and they haven't done any studies to, to generally accept the opinion of, uh, the Daubert's expert, and we're going to talk about where that comes from. So, um, but so uh, Merrill Dow won at trial, or well, it was before trial. Ne- never, it didn't get to trial. It was uh, dismissed before trial through the summary ju- through the summary judgment. Um, then after that, of course, the Daubert's appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's the the Ninth Circuit is is the Court of Appeal is the appeals court, the federal appeals court. Uh, for California, and I think it's some other states as well. But definitely, when cat when you appeal, uh, a a uh, a judgment in federal court in California, the appeals court you go to is the Ninth Circuit. So the next step they took was the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit actually agreed with um the pharmaceutical company once again. So that's two losses for the Daubert family. Um, so at this point. Now they appealed and they take it all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, so that's what happened procedurally. You had a summary judgment that was granted on behalf of the defendant, which is the pharmaceutical company. Um, you had an appeal from that from that court ruling, the original trial court ruling. Or um, Then from there, um, they appealed to the Ninth Circuit District Court of Appeals. Um, the Court of Appeals uh, said the same thing that the, the, the previous court said. So then... Um, the plaintiff had one more effort, um, in appealing and they appealed to the superior court of, you know, the Supreme court, I'm sorry, of the United States. Um, so, um, now, uh, you heard generally, you heard generally accepted. Where, where's that verbiage come from? Um, it comes from, um, the Fry case, uh, and this is Fry versus United States. This case was in 19, uh, case was ruled in 1923 so if Daubert if the Daubert case is in 1993 that means uh before this case had come into play um the Fry case was I mean was the ruling precedent for 70 years from 1923 to 1993 um so the Fry case essentially said um in a nutshell that expert testimony slash scientific testimony cannot come into trial unless it has been generally accepted by the scientific community. Um, that means there have to be some type of, you know, there has to be some type of uh, published work or something saying that, Hey, what, what's being used here, uh, to testify and, uh, and yeah, to testify or to give knowledge at a trial, uh, to assist the trier of fact, uh, has been accepted that it was, so that that's almost a very strict standard um because what we got to learn about science is um science isn't always necessarily something that requires you to wear a lab coat right or or or, or test uh you know in a it, with some type of a beaker or um a test tube of some sort so you know you don't you know it's not the um what what the fry case essentially said is it said science is essentially limited to the very strict realm of 
the the uh the the scientists, the doctors, um, and everyone that 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 decides what gets in and what doesn't. So the Fry case essentially married court and court rulings with science. Um and that's kind of dangerous because in real life science can change, right? There's something that can be accepted um scientifically by all bodies at one point and then later on they can find out, oh maybe we were wrong and it changes. The court does not have the luxury of waiting. You know, the court courts have to make a decision, uh, a right now decision. And uh, so they so to to join court rulings with um, the overall um, acceptance of the scientific community is kind of dangerous. Uh, so but it was but of course it made it very strict. So essentially any almost any opinion evidence that was based on, I guess, air quote science um could not get into court even if it would have helped the jury um uh figure out what what was going on in the case it's not it wasn't accepted unless um it wasn't allowed in court i'm sorry it wasn't admitted into court or into evidence unless it was accepted by the scientific community so the fry case was very very strict on what got in and what didn't get in um so what happened in 1975 um the United States Congress um, adopted uh, what they call the Federal Rules of Evidence. Um, so between 1923 and 1993, 70 years, somewhere in the middle, around 1975, which is about 52 years later, um, the, uh, the, con- the United States Congress actually adopted a rule that spoke to scientific evidence. But the thing is, that rule didn't sound anything like the Fry case. So now you have two differing things that are applying here. You have the Fry case, which had been the standard and the precedent that came from what we call common law or from court court made ruling. So the Fry case was a court made rule. Then later on, you have the federal courts that create another rule, but it's not court made. It's essentially um, le- a legislatively made and adopted rule that apply to scientific evidence and that's rule 702 and here's how the rule reads um it says in part um if scientific technical or other specialized knowledge will assist the trier of fact or jury um to understand the evidence or to determine a fact an issue a witness qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education may testify thereto in the form of opinion or otherwise. So, if if you read that, there's no uh, requirement that what they testify to must be generally accepted by the scientific community. So, you see how the Fry case from 1923 says it doesn't get in unless... The scientific community, you know, the the guy, the guys in lab coats and glasses and pocket protectors say it's good. Um, but then you have this new rule that comes out in the form, and it's not a it's not case law. It's the the legislature saying, hey, this is the rule, this is the book. You apply you apply this. This is the federal rules of evidence, but um, and it gives a standard, a new standard, and the standard does not include general general acceptance by the scientific community. So it, it is a, a way, it is a, um, a less strict standard. So there's, all, there's automatically no more requirement that this testimony or the subject matter of this testimony be based on and accepted uh, by the scientific community. So you see that's a, that's a change. So now that we're in this Daubert case, the court is looking at the Daubert court, and now we're fast forwarding back to 1993, the Darbert Court is now looking at two different standards, a 1923 standard and the 1975 uh, standard that was created by the Federal Rules of Evidence. And they're trying to figure out which one to apply. Um, so that's where we are. So first, let's determine what science is, because the Fry case kind of limits uh, what science actually is. In other, in other words, science has to be accepted by the by, you know, this is you no, know, of course, this is isn't you know, the actual legal language, but it pretty much says that the science in order for it to be accepted in the court and admissible, um, the guys in the white lab coats, glasses and pocket protectors, the nerdy guys, uh, the scientific community have to accept it. 
Um, and that's it. If, if it's not accepted, it doesn't get in. And that's one reason why um, Dow Pharmaceutical, the Dow Pharmaceutical Company, was they were arguing that because what happened is the Darbert family they hired or, or they got they actually got um, people that did research and scientists uh, to kind of look into the drug and test it. So they did animal testing. Um, and this is uh, animal testing in vitro, which is while the animal was pregnant and, uh, animal testing, um, after, uh, the animals had been born. So I don't know if they did it in mice or what, what animal they used, but, um, through this testing, they, they were showing that even, even the, the, the bendectin was causing birth defects, even in animals during testing. Um, the problem was the, and it, the, that the court there was a previous case the fry case and and the dow company did not want that scientific research or that research that these uh these scientists had done to be to come into court because that would kill that would kill their case if the whole case is about whether or not their drug caused a birth defect um then they were going to do everything they can to keep that evidence out so they used the fry standard. They told the court, hey, well, no matter what they did, based upon what they're saying in their documents, they that can't come in because there's, it's not generally accepted in the scientific community. Um, the, the test they did, whatever they did to determine that, um, to come to the conclusion that our drug caused the birth defect, um, this, this, is new, this is something new that they've created and it's not generally accepted. Uh, based upon the fry standard, so they were trying to keep it out. So, from a um, uh, tactical standpoint, that's what they were trying to do. Their strategy was to try to keep that stuff out. Because guess what? If you can't bring in scientific, if the if the Daubert family couldn't bring in an expert to say that this drug caused the birth defect, that kills their case. That means they can't get this. Their lawsuit doesn't go forward. They can't get millions of dollars. Uh, because their children have birth defects. Um, so that's what Dow Pharmaceutical was trying to do. If they could keep that out, then that kills their opponent's case, the plaintiff's case. Um, so the plaintiff, on the other hand, they were arguing this new standard that the government, uh, that the legislature actually created and adopted. So you have two standards. So if it was just a fry standard, it would be a situation, it probably would have, would have been much harder for the plaintiff to argue because there wouldn't have been anything for them to counter. So the fry case would have been it. And they probably, we probably wouldn't be talking about this case because the fry standard would have been the be all end all. But what messed things up for uh, the Dow Pharmaceutical Company is that 20 plus, 20 something years earlier, um, the government or the legislature had adopted a new, a rule of evidence that went against the fry standard. Um, what's crazy, you know, sometimes what the court does and what the legislature does when they adopt laws, it, it, sometimes it bumps heads, but no one knows. Um, you don't know until you get to trial and you have, you know, smart lawyers who look at the rules of evidence and say, hold on, this says this, but this says this. The court needs to make a decision to tell us which one is going to apply. So that, that's where the court was. That's where the Supreme Court was uh, with the Darwin case. They were now trying to figure out, okay, so what standard are we going to apply? There are two standards here. An old standard, which has been the, BR, which has been the, the, the iron rule of law since 1923, and now um, in 1975, what, from 75 to 1993, I believe it's 18 years. Yeah, 18 years, 18 years. 18 years ago, um, we, I mean, our government, our legislatures adopted this new rule that's now in the rules of evidence. So we have two conflicting rules that govern the admissibility of scientific or um, expert opinion as evidence. So we have to make a decision. Um, so that's one reason why the, why the Supreme Court took the case, because um, a lot of a lot of. Uh, cases that get appealed to the Supreme Court get turned down. Um, matter of fact, what I think maybe uh, 1% of cases that get appealed all the way to the top to the Supreme Court, um, maybe only 1% of them get heard or something like that. It's, it's very low, 10% at most. But it's not most cases that where people try to appeal to the Supreme Court, they get turned away. And this case essentially isn't a case that involves anything constitutional, uh, so the ruling in this case 
it wouldn't have had any bearing on anybody else. It's not like it would have affected affected the whole of society. Now it would have stopped, you know, it would have had some bearings on whether or not a danger a possibly dangerous drug goes out to the public. But when it comes to whether or not it was a constitutional question, it wasn't. This is something that was relatively unimportant that normally um I could I could I would have seen the Supreme Court not granting certiorari or not deciding to hear. They could have easily turned it away. But they had to hear it because now you have an old standard that was actually created by an older Supreme Court back in 1923. And now you have this new standard that has been created by the legislature. So they had to hear this because you can't have you can't have effective trials um, without one rule. So you got two different rules that go against each other. So um, the Supreme Court and da- in the in this in the case at hand, Daubert had to make a decision. You have two differing rules that apply to say different things, and they're about the same thing: the admissibility of scientific evidence. So that's one reason they had to hear the case. Um, it wasn't necessarily about the importance of those children that that had birth defects. Um, I hate I hate to sound insensitive, but I don't think I think the court could have I don't think the court could have cared less about that. What they cared about is standards. Um, and, in court and in, in, in law, you have to have standards. We have to be able to walk into court and at least know what the rules are. That doesn't mean they're not subject to being changed through the process, but we have to start somewhere with the hard line rule before we even get there. So the Supreme court was here in this case, so they could figure out what the hard line rule was. It's old case law, um, or this new law, this rule 702 that was adopted, um, in the rules of evidence in 1975. So now, now that I've said all that, uh, the court, uh, first let's determine what scientific means. Um, so, uh, like I said before, the text of rule 702 did not make admissibility of expert testimony dependent on general acceptance. So that's the difference. Fry must be generally accept must be generally accepted. Um, and rule 702, um, of the, uh, federal, um, uh, rules of evidence said they made no mention of, of, uh, of accept of, uh, general acceptance by the scientific community. So, uh, first, uh, scientific, uh, scientific knowledge, um, meaning that testimony must be scientific in nature, uh, and must be grounded in knowledge. What's that? What scientific means? It, it, what, what, what does scientific mean? The word scientific when it comes to um, in the legal realm, it means something that is based in knowledge, something that is based in knowledge and something that has some type of a test so it can be checked. Um, so um, when we say science, think of process. We have knowledge and this is knowledge that's either going to help that's going to help uh, the trier fact or the jury in making making a determination. So is it going to help? And two, is there a process by which it can be tested? In other words, so when we talk about science, science essentially means a process. Um, so if you're going to make a determination in court, uh, uh, give some type of expert opinion uh, based upon your field of expertise, you're going to have to tell us, be able to tell us how you drew that conclusion. Uh, so you have to let us know what your process was. Um, so it's not about whether or not this is some type of generally accepted scientific um, subject. Um, it's about whether or not you are an expert in a specific knowledge, uh, specific field of knowledge and and whether or not you qualify to be able to come in and give an opinion. Um, and then with that opinion, are you able to back that opinion up with uh, a process and, and are you able to tell the court how you came to your conclusion? Um, so there's, so um, that's what science means, um, at least uh, the Daubert court said what science means. So. Um, the Daubert court had a standard. It, it essentially gave us three, uh, three questions we had to ask, or uh, three, three, three prong tests. First, scientific knowledge, um, meaning that the testimony mu- must be scientific in nature and must be grounded in knowledge. Uh, so what that means is this much. So it means first, was it scientific? What by scientific was it something that was grounded in knowledge? That's the first question we asked. Is this something that is a specific field that requires at least some type of um, um, expertise? Um, it does. It didn't require general acceptance. It just is this something that requires? Is this person that's on the stand testifying about something? 
is this a are they testifying about something that requires a specific knowledge base? Um, that's what. So that's all that's required to make it a science. So that's first question. Is it scientific? Second question that must be answered is. It is this, does the scientific knowledge that this person is testifying to, does it actually assist the trier fact? And when we say trier fact, that's the jury or the, or the jury or in some cases the judge that's determining uh, guilt or innocence. So is the knowledge that they're giving, is it helping? The, is it helping either way, win or lose? Is it helping the trier fact come to a decision? In other words, is it useful? Um, is it helping them understand and determine a fact at issue in the case? Um, so that's then the third question, or it is not really a question. The third thing uh, that the Daubert court requires is that the judge, uh, at the end of the day, the judge be the gatekeeper of over we, uh, whether or not those first two questions are answered. So two questions that have to be answered, and the third and um and the third prong is that the judge has to determine. The judge has the um, authority to determine whether or not one um the information that's being given or the testimony is scientific. I mean, it's based on knowledge and there's some type of process that can be, um, that can be testified to as to what the base of the knowledge is and what the conclusion, um, that the expert comes to. Um, and then two is that knowledge and is that testimony, is it helping us in trial? Um, is it assisting me in understanding what happened so I can make a sound decision? So two questions, is it scientific or based in knowledge and process? Uh, then the second question is, is that process or is that scientific information that you're giving us? Is it actually helping us? Is it assisting me to get to the truth? Um, so those are the two questions that have to be answered. And the, the third requirement is that the person that answers the question and, and it has the final determination is the judge. So the judge is the gatekeeper to determine uh, whether or not those two quest questions are answered in the affirmative to allow to allow before evidence can be allowed in. So that was that was, that's pretty much the ruling of the court. Uh, the court stressed um, the new standard under Rule 702. Um, and it says scientific conclusions are subject. I mean, well, here's the rationale. I'm sorry. The court stressed that the new standard under Rule 702 was rooted in the judicial process and intended to separate um, the judicial process from science. Remember, in the Fry case, um, it pretty much made the judicial process and science the same. So, in other words, ju the judicial process was halted if science didn't agree. That means we can't, we have to make, we can't make a decision at all, and we have to make a decision um, and uh, to not let evidence in that may help us only because the scientific community doesn't accept it. So that means the scientific community almost was just determining what got in and what didn't get into a court of law. And the, sci the court, a court of law and the scientific community are two different things. So the Fry, the Fry case almost created a merger um, of the scientific community and the court. Uh, so what... Um, what the uh, Darbert court is now saying is that we want to separate those. We don't want to, we, we want to make it where uh, the court makes decisions um, and we're not necessarily uh, uh, handcuffed by whether or not uh, the scientific community accepts it. Um, we want to, we want the judge to determine whether it's junk science and whether it's good enough to come in. And once it comes in, then the trier fact or the jury can determine whether or not they're going to consider it. Um, so what this does is it, uh, it opens up the gate for more things to be, to come into court for more opinion testimony to come in court. Uh, but the court stressed the new standard was rooted in the judicial process. Um, and it intended to separate, um, the judicial process from the search for scientific truth. Um, and the court and air in quotes, uh, says scientific conclusions are subject to perpet perpetual revision or change um law on the other hand must resolve disputes finally and quickly meaning we can't depend on whether or not something's accepted scientifically because down the road that may change um, we have to make right now decisions about what's acceptable and what's going to help in court um and then you also have to figure out you also have to think about the fact the, the fact that both sides in the case uh, can bring in scientists or not scientists. They can bring in experts. 
Uh, so if there's something that you feel the other side, if the other side is bringing in something you feel is not valid, you can always bring someone else in to tell us why it is or is not valid. Um, so the aftermath of the Daubert case. So um, just in a nutshell, for those that may not be understanding, because I know I'm talking a lot, um, the in, the court and Daubert actually ruled in favor of the Daubert family. So the standard they chose to apply was not the old fry standard. They kicked the old fry standard out and they now accepted the new rule 702 standard, uh, which, which generally allows any expert testimony in as long as it's scientific or knowledge based with the process that can be explained. And two, uh, whether, it, uh, whether or not it, it has to actually assist the trier of fact in making a decision, uh, and, and, uh, in the case. So those two questions had to be answered. So that's the new standard under the Daubert rule. I mean, uh, under the court. Fry is gone, and we now have this Daubert slash Rule 702 standard. The two questions, the two, the two questions that have to be answered. Um, so after Daubert, um, it was expected that a range of scientific opinion ev evidence would be used in court. Now that it's wide open, um, however. Courts have strictly applied the Daubert standard, meaning they, they apply those two questions. Is it scientific, meaning is it based in knowledge, and is there a process that can be tested that we can look at and, and, and test the validity? And then two, um, is it actually helping us make a decision in court? Um, so even though people would say, well, the Fry standard was much tougher and it didn't let as much stuff in and there was no room for junk science, the Daubert uh, standard is still pretty tough because the judge gets to be the gatekeeper. The judge is sitting there listening to this testimony or listening to this person being tendered as an expert, and they then get to decide. Uh, no, I think he, I think he's full of, I think he or she's full of crap. There's, there's some crap. It's not really based on science, and it's not helping us. So it's still pretty strict. Um, so it kept junk science, or what they call, it's, it's still keeping junk science or pseudoscience from coming into court and kind of misdirecting jurors. Um, so um, the Daubert case is more strong, is stronger and it's more strict than, um, than, than the, than this case, at least uh, what Merrill, what uh, Merrill Dow pharmaceuticals was arguing. So of course the outcome of the case is that the evidence um, the, the, the court ruled that um, the trial court was wrong um, in granting the, the summary judgment. And the appeals court was wrong and they overturned it. And they said, well, this um, this testimony can now come in from this expert that's done this animal testing. So um, just because it comes in does, you know, still doesn't mean that the jury is going to rule in their favor. It just allowed them to get the evidence in. Um, like I said, they still have to jump the hurdle. You know, there is a burden of proof, right? There's a, bur there's a bur burden of proof and um, they still have to. Um, get the science to the jury in an understandable manner and it can't misdirect them. And then you, you know, you have the judge as well. Uh, so that is the Darbert case in a nutshell. So, um, the, what the holding of the case, the federal rules of evidence, uh, governs the admission of scientific evidence in trial held in federal court. Uh, they require that the trial judge act as the gatekeeper before admitting the evidence determining that the evidence is scientifically valid, meaning that it's um, knowledge-based and there is a process by which it can be tested and that the process needs to be talked about. And two, uh, that it's relevant to the case at hand and it's actually helping the trier fact um, come to a conclusion in the case. So, th that, so the, new, the, the Daubert standard, I want you guys to know the Daubert standard. One is it scientific? Is it not? Is it science? In other words, is it knowledge based? It doesn't mean it has to be lab coats, um, but is it knowledge based? And is there a process um, that can be t that can be uh, discussed and and tested uh, for how this person came up with this uh, conclusion? So, um, and then th th that's the first question. Then the second question is whether or not it's relevant or helping us at trial. So um, what that means, uh, let's say we're having a trial about uh, um, we're trying to figure out, uh, let's say there's a murder trial and we're trying to, you know, this a badly decomposed body, um, uh, but the body was wearing, uh, had a weave in his head. Um, in determining 
who in, in determining who the person was and identifying them based upon the hair. Let's say they bring in a weave expert, a hairdresser. Now, a hairdresser is not a scientist, right? They don't wear lab coats. But if this person is testifying to a specific um, a subject matter that requires a knowledge base and there is a means and a process by which they're going to come to their conclusion, that person, even though they're not a scientist wearing a lab coat, they can come in and at least tell us that what type of weave that is. Uh, that is yakky. Um, yeah, you put it the, the way you weave in the hair is like this. Um, or yes, uh, I know who that is because I did that. I, I actually did that girl's hair and that's how I do my weaves. I have a specific way that I weave my weaves in a woman's head. So, so even though that you may say that's not scientific, it is because there's a knowledge base and there's someone that can testify to a process, um, that a lot that, that brings them to, to their conclusion. So essentially what, um, what the what the Darber case says is anything can be science. Um now can't now now if it's bull crap it can't be accepted, but anything can be science if it's gonna help us come to draw a conclusion in the case. So you know, in other words, it didn't have to be the lab coat nerd guys just saying what comes in um and determining what comes in a trial and in, in a court of law. Um the court of law is all about what is relevant and what helps us determine what happened in the case it's not all, always about this generally general acceptance of the science community um if we have an expert hairdresser that can come in and talk talk about uh the weave in this dead body's hair and who it is that person is helping us it's relevant evidence and that person has a knowledge base and i'm i'm, I'm sure they can tell us about how the weave was put in this person's head um to help us identify who that person is or at least who did the weave or where they bought the weed from, or something like that. I know that's kind of a, a left field explanation, but I use that to show that even a person that's not necessarily a scientist can be brought to court and asked for a prof- I mean, for a, a uh, an expert opinion. So an expert opinion can come from someone who has a knowledge base and is in a specific um, subject matter, and they're coming to talk about that. So that that's what expert opinion is. It doesn't just require us to be scientists. So uh, that's the Darbert case um, in a nutshell. I'm going to post it so you can actually read it um, now from that. Uh, now let's talk about now that we've talked about the Darbert case. What is the process for getting expert testimony in a trial? Um, you guys are going to be, let's say, if you're going to be a medical examiner or um, in some type of law enforcement capacity, you may be asked to come to court to talk about ballistics, whether or not um, that is in fact a bullet hole, or uh, what what type, what the caliber, of the what caliber was you, what caliber weapon was used in this murder, or what shell casing, or, or how you concluded that this was the murder weapon. Um, all of that requires an opinion. Now, the thing about experts coming into a trial, experts are not the be all end all, right? They're not um they're not deities that you know that are omnipotent and come to court and they say well it is because i said it was they are simply people that have a knowledge base that are asked to come in court look at something test something beforehand and give an opinion that's why we call it we you know we call it expert opinion testimony it doesn't it, it just, it's an opinion it doesn't mean it has to be accepted um now it, it, by, by the jury the jury can hear your opinion and still be like uh, I don't believe you guilty or not guilty, um, but it, it still can come in if it's going to at least help the jury make their determination. Um, so what's the process? Um, if you're going to take the stand as an expert, you may be coming in as a medical examiner to, the, to tell us what the cause of death was. That means you've done a whole autopsy. Now, remember the, what the Darbert case said. Um, it said it must be science. I mean, based on knowledge, what that means is before I can tender you as an expert, if I'm calling you as a witness, if the prosecutor is putting you on the stand, first, first and foremost, they're going to have to bolster who you are and, and you're going to have to tell the court why you're here and why you're qualified to be here. So in other words, education, background, um, how many years on the force, how many autopsies you've done. And then you're also going to have to talk about the process of the autopsy. Remember we talked about it's not science unless it's a, it's a knowledge, something based in knowledge of a, of a specific uh, subject matter. 
and there's a process by which that can be tested um, or there's a process that you can go through to let us know how you how you're coming to your opinion. So as an expert witness, you're going to have to talk about that process um, and the process you use to come to, to come to your to draw your conclusion that you come to in your opinion. Um, so you're going to have to talk. You're going to be asked, be asked questions or you should be asked questions, should be asked questions about um your expertise, you know, your um, experience, and then what process you use to come to your conclusion. And then you get asked questions about the conclusion. So then you're tendered as an expert. So the way the trial process goes, you can be asked a lot of questions, but the opposing side uh, can what we call void deer. Now, there's void deer in the sense of uh, questioning a juror. Um, or, or, or having back and forth questions with the jury pool to determine who gets in the jury. But there's another type of void deer, um, which is pretty much just having a conversation or, or to t- it means to tell the truth in French, right? So um, this is a conversation between a, an attorney, an opposing attorney, and a, and a witness to question and, and to check, sometimes even challenge whether or not this person is in fact an expert. So before this person can eat, sometimes before this person is even allowed to testify in front of a jury, um, or they may even be beginning their testimony, and the opposing attorneys may say, "Hey, may say I want to void dear, I want to void dear this witness, um, meaning I want to question this witness outside the presence of the jury to determine whether or not this person is actually an expert." And at that point, now. Just like cross-examination, the opposing party gets to ask you questions uh, about whether or not you should even be allowed in here to give this testimony. Um, and that, uh, this is all outside the presence of the jury. Once this is done, then the judge can, you know, you can make a motion on whether or not to exclude this person from testifying. Um, and, you know, at which juncture the judge can make a decision, yay or nay, if if it's, of course, if, if they are allowed to testify, they now get to testify. Now, um, the attorney still gets when the jury comes back in and this person is allowed to continue testifying if they are um, at that point and during cross examination, when, when the opposing party gets their chance to cross examine, they can still revisit and bring up some of these questions that may challenge um, this person's um, knowledge base or what you know, or challenge their expertise. Um, because, of course, you know, we talked about the purpose of cross examination it is essentially um, it's essentially to, uh, make the jury not trust you. It's essentially to challenge, um, whether or not you're te- one telling the truth, whether or not you know what you're talking about. Um, if they can, if they can drop that little bit, uh, of, uh, uh, iota of doubt in the jury that can change the case either way. Um, so they're still allowed to question you, but that is the pro that is primarily the process. You don't, you're not always going to get the void deer treatment from opposing counsel, but before you get on the stand, or oh, I'm sorry, once you get on the stand, before you actually give the expert testimony, um, which is the conclusion they're trying to draw. So if you're up there to testify as to uh, about whether or not this is, in fact, the murder weapon, you're not just going to get up there and say, yep, my name is Brenton Boyce. That's the murder weapon and, and, and walk in and step down. They're going to have to lay the foundation. That's what it's called, laying the foundation for why you're here today, why you're qualified to be talking about what you're qualified to talk about. And you're going to have to talk about the process uh, that you use to draw that conclusion. And then you draw the conclusion. So any, so if you try to draw that conclusion uh, before you've done all that, before a foundation has been laid, the opposing party, if they're paying attention, should get up and object and say lack of foundation. Um, you know, there's no, the foundation hasn't been laid. He, this person has not been established as an expert. Um so if you're not establishing that as, as an expert, that means the person that's questioning you uh, has the duty to now ask more questions to bolster your credibility um, and and talk more about the process you use to draw your conclusion. So it's all about process. That's what uh, scientific means. Um, it, it means knowledge base in a specific field of stu- uh, in a specific subject matter. And there has to be a process that can be reviewed or a process that you can show a process for how you draw the conclusion you drew. So just remember that. So I'm going to post a case. Um, to, tonight's uh, c- a class or, or lecture was all about 
the admissibility of scientific not well scientific uh, testimony or a scientific opinion testimony and evidence. Um, remember we said before, evidence doesn't get in unless it's testified to, right? Um, so your expert opinion may be important on uh, in the determination of whether or not this shell casing found came from this gun and was actually the cause of death. So now you get to kind of see the call, the link between um, how testimony become, I mean, uh, becomes physical evidence and how physical evidence can't even get in unless it's testified to. Um, so that is the lesson for tonight. Um, I hope uh, that you learned something. I know it's pretty deep. I know our other discussions have been straight from the book, kind of shallow discussion, right? Kind of how how to testify. Uh, this has been the deepest we've talked about, you know, cases and stuff like this the whole time. But just read the case. I know it's boring. The, the title of the case even sounds boring. But uh, just learn something from it. Uh, there will be questions on um, the final exam regarding like scientific evidence and what's admissible and what the process is, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So um, that's it for this evening. If you have any questions, please email me. Uh, you have my email. Um, I'll, I'll post it when I post this. Um, but you guys take care. All right. Bye-bye.